Okay, I guess we can start now. And let me welcome you all on board. Uh, first, my name is Sarah Ramadan. I'm founder of Pharma Vigit Academy. Assalamu alaikum likul al hudur. Ismi Sarah Ramadan. Arahab bi kul yom fi our webinar. Bnitkalim in the harda min minasit Pharma Vigit Academy. Maana speaker giddan mubayyiz. Hanitkalim maaku an wahda min aham topics il hanihki aliha al ayam gaya. Ubunas bi chahra Ramadan fadil. Uh, I hope everyone can join. Just please, if you don't mind, if you need the communication to be in Arabic or English, if you can just we check if we have any non-Arabic speakers, that would be great to just know and welcome you on board. So uh, if you are a non-Arabic non speaker, please just raise your hand so we can address if we can continue in Arabic or English or we can even blend. Okay, so we have one consular. Who else? Um, I'm saying the name correct. Consular. Okay, welcome on board. Who else? There is. Okay. I guess we have one uh, non Arabic speaker. So, Dr. Ziad, we need to go in English and we can even blend between Arabic and English, which will be even much better. Okay. Uh, happy Ramadan, everyone. Inshallah, it will be a great time for all of you and your families. And we wish you that this day will come with all the happiness and health we have. Uh, I will just introduce my like extraordinary speaker today, Dr. Ziad al -Gamal. And most of you, I know that you know him, but let me just give a glimpse. Dr. Ziad had more than 15 years of combined experience in healthcare management, education, and pharmaceutical industry. I'm so proud that he is also graduated from Pharmacy Alexandria University, year two, uh, 2002, and with a bachelor degree in pharmaceutical sciences. He worked in Johnson & Johnson, Saudi Arabia for more than five years before he immigrated to Canada to start a new journey. 2009 was a starting point to have a management career. He achieved the Pharmacy Examining Board of Canada and became the first registered pharmacist in Alberta, July 2009. Dr. Jamal became a manager owner for the franchise at Sugar Drug Mart Retail Pharmacy for seven years in Canada from 2011 to 2016. During that time, he became a certified diabetes educator certification, CDB, CDE, additional prescribing authority in the, prov uh, the province of Alberta and board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and topped it up with the doctorate in pharmacy degree from University of Colorado, Denver. He also worked as an instructor for international pharmacy graduates. And also he is the founder and the manager of Colimedex Canada for a combined of total seven years. Since 2016, he moved again to UEE and now he's a lead clinical staff pharmacist at Cleveland Abu Dhabi. And he achieved a certification of a strategic management from Harvard University. Dr. Al-Jamal also earned his master's degree in management from Harvard University on November, 2020 and his postgraduate studies at Versailles practical experience enhanced uh, his experience in business, understanding all the financial analysis capabilities and evaluated all the different programs in efficient and successful way. Dr. Jama, with no further introduction, welcome on board with us in Pharma Vigate Academy and please be on the stage. We invite, encourage everyone to keep like informative to keep interactive and we will have a session for almost one hour 45 minutes and then you can have all the addressed q a for dr Jamal, and he will answer very gratefully thanks dr Jamal, and happy ramadan for you and all your family please take the stage up assalamu alaikum thank you so much dr sarah for this uh, introduction I'm so happy that I'm uh, between and among my brothers and sisters in UAE and uh, Alexandria. So what an amazing uh, opportunity to be online now on this social media and uh, digital platforms that brings us together uh, with no barriers. Uh, 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 thank you, Dr. Sarah Ramadan, the owner of PharmaVigate for sponsoring this uh, event to bring this knowledge and share the best practices with my brothers and sisters uh, all over uh, the globe. So uh, today, inshallah, it's a very, very interesting topic and I hope you uh, will enjoy it and you will take this information 
and uh, take it back to your practice, whether you practice in clinical pharmacy or you practice in retail, because for me, there is no separation. You can make the change and you can have a role and an impact wherever uh, you are practicing. So managing diabetes in Ramadan, uh, it is a very important topic and the American Diabetes Association and the Canadian Diabetes Association, they adopted guidelines and created guidelines for uh, those uh, patient population. And uh, many uh, scholars and scientists, they uh, contributed into the IDF, which is the International Diabetes Federation uh, guidelines. They created um, Ramadan uh, fasting safely uh, guidelines and the DAR guidelines, which is Diabetes and Ramadan uh, Alliance. Uh, they, they worked hand in hand and they created those amazing guidelines that were adapted by the American Diabetes Association and the Canadian Diabetes, which is uh, Diabetes Canada. So it, uh, it brings an honor to me to be just a facilitator to bring this knowledge and share it with you. And uh, as we mentioned, you can take it back to your family if you have someone with diabetes in the family or a neighbor or your patients. So our agenda today will uh, basically discuss the pre-Ramadan diabetes management planning. So if the patient is planning to fast, we assess those six domains. So the first is risk assessment. Um, and then the medication assessment, does this medication suits this patient if he is diabetic and is planning to fast? And the medication assessment will be three domains, the non-insulin pharmacotherapy for type 2 uh, diabetes, which is the pills, the tablets, and the non-insulin injections. Also, we'll discuss the insulin management for type 2 and the insulin management for type 1. The third domain would be the nutrition and hydration uh, advice for the patients fasting Ramadan, because nutrition is very important when it comes to Ramadan uh, and so on. Exercise advice specifically for people fasting Ramadan and when to break the fast. And what is the monitoring recommendation? How many times we monitor our blood sugar level if we are type one or type two and so on and so forth. So why patients who fast Ramadan are considered special patient population? So the patients uh, who are diabetic and plan to fast Ramadan, they come with a risk. Fasting itself brings some risk for those patient population, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, it, uh, it, like there are increased risk. And when the scientists, they made some trials and compared it to a control, so how many diabetic ketoacidosis patients were admitted in the hospital during Ramadan compared to the number of patients who were admitted with DKA diabetic ketoacidosis before Ramadan as a control. So the, there was an increased number of DKAs. The same thing happened with hypoglycemia. There is an increased risk with fasting. Hyperglycemia because of the nutritional part also, the sugary drinks and, and, uh, and, uh, and the sweets that increase in Ramadan and the bigger meals. Also, the dehydration risk in Ramadan increases even thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, uh, God forbid, um, uh, strokes and DVTs. Diabetes Canada has a key message for all adults with type one and type two diabetes who intend to fast Ramadan should receive an individualized assessment pre-Ramadan. So any patient that is planning to fast, we have to do this, what we're doing now, we'll sit with our patient ahead of Ramadan and our plan should include two things, the risk categorization, so assess where is this patient standing from a risk point of view, should he fast or not? And the other point, which is the individualized diabetes management plan, which is, uh, in, uh, which is the six domains that we mentioned. So those are the six domains that we will discuss today that should make a comprehensive plan for a patient in case 
this patient is planning to fast Ramadan. Number one is the risk stratification. Also, blood glucose monitoring, the frequency, those we already discussed those sits, but, but we will break them down one by one and go in depth with each category and domain. So we'll start first with the risk stratification. To fast or not to fast, that is the question. So what, uh, what affects the, the risk, increases or decreases the risk of uh, Ramadan fasting? Number one, the, the two things uh, are the key players for this uh, increased risk is the type of diabetes itself and the patient uh, specific characteristics. So we can see those six domains down there. So the type of diabetes, patients with type one are more prone for complications than type two. So the patient medication, we will discuss that in details, is the patient taking only metformin, which has no hypoglycemia risk, or he's taking a secretagogue or, a, or, a, or an insulin secretagogue like a, a tablet, sulfonylurea, uh, uh, amaryl, dawanil, uh, glimepride, gliburide, glyclazide, or he's taking insulin bolus. So he's taking fast-acting insulin, uh, epidra, uh, those humalog, the fast-acting insulins. So those, they increase the risk of the patient uh, uh, risk uh, stratification uh, domain. So uh, the, the third domain would be individual hypoglycemia risk. The, the patient himself, they might have an added intrinsic risk to have hypoglycemia. The frail patients have higher risks. So the older the patient is, the patient has comorbidities, as we will see in the next point, complications and comorbidities. If the patient has kidney failure, chronic kidney failure, acute kidney failure, um, neuropathy also affects if you have the nerve damage, like uh, uh, autonomic neuropathy or peripheral neuropathy. This also decreases the feeling and the sensation of the patient with the hypoglycemia signs and symptoms. If the patient is going into hypo, sometimes he has palpitation, sweating. He would know that he's going into hypo, so he goes and treats it. For patients have long-term diabetes, or untreated diabetes or poorly managed diabetes, they also, those alarming signs, they start fading away. So those patients would have higher risk uh, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, fasting category, so they should not be fasting. And we'll discuss that also in details in uh, the next few slides. Also the individual social and work circumstances. So we, if we have two twins, one is working an office job in the air condition and his other twin is working a labor job in a farm or in construction in the outdoors when it's super hot and uh, risk of dehydration is high. Um, they will not be the same. So this is what you need to assess with your patient. The, the last bullet, which is the previous Ramadan experience, this was added in the latest guidelines 2021 in January, which is what was the previous Ramadan experience with this patient? Did he fast last year or not? And if he fasted, did he fast safely? And was his uh, experience was well? Did he have hypoglycemia? Did he go hospitalized by DKA? Did he intend to fast the whole 30 days, but he succeeded to fast only 20? And what prevented him from fasting the 30 days? So the IDF International Diabetes Federation in, uh, um, in collaboration with the DAR uh, Alliance, which is Diabetes and Ramadan Alliance. And by the way, I'm referencing those guidelines uh, with uh, amazing professors and scholars and uh, scientists. And one of them is Dr. Muhammad Hassanin. He is graduate of Alexandria University Medical School. And he is one of the most eminent professors uh, that had major contribution in the IDF guidelines. And he was one of the creators of the DAR Alliance as well and the Canadian guidelines. And I attended many of his sessions uh, in UAE and online in, in Canada, amazing professor. And he worked in Jocelyn Diabetes uh, Center, which is one of the most and the biggest uh, uh, centers of research about diabetes. Also, his colleague, Dr. Osama Hamdi, I cannot 
forget uh, him. He also contributed in the IDF and DAR, and he works for Harvard Medical School and the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, also the biggest research diabetes center uh, in the world. So the IDF guidelines risk stratification made it at, like uh, a satellite, red, yellow, and green. So the red is the very high risk, yellow is only high risk, green is moderate to low risk. So the red, very high risk, this patient must not fast. Yellow should not fast. Green, moderate to low, just uh, he, he can fast safely after discussing that with their healthcare professional. And also this is the scientific uh, advice and uh, the, the scientific opinion. And it is included with the religious authorities as well in many countries was a contributor into DAR and IDF, and also Al-Azhar was a contributor into that uh, guidelines and uh, this risk stratification. So let's start with the very high risk. So who falls into the very high risk uh, category, which must not fast? So poorly control the type one. If a patient has type one and he's entering Ramadan with an A1C more than nine, this patient must not fast. A patient that has a hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemia within three months of Ramadan, that's a must not. A recurrent hypoglycemia and or unawareness of hypoglycemia. Unawareness, this is what, what I told you about. If this patient is getting hypos, but he's not feeling it, so he's getting unawareness. And there are many, many ways how to treat the unawareness of hypoglycemia. This, inshallah, we can discuss in a separate course through Pharmavigate in the near future, inshallah. Ketoacidosis, if the patient within three months of Ramadan had a DKA and hospitalized, should not fast this Ramadan. A hyperosmolar hyperglycemic coma, this happens mostly with type two, not type one. Within three months, should not fast, must not fast. Acute illness, so now he is hospitalized in the in a hospital or with acute illness, diarrhea, vomiting, this patient is a very high risk and must not fast. Patient Bihselkelia is just doing dialysis, stage four or five. Um, first time here to have pregnancy, pregnancy in diabetes or gestational diabetes. If the patient is pregnant before, um, before uh, getting uh, uh, so diabetic before pregnancy or gut pregnancy with diabetes, which is GDM, gestational diabetes, and treated with insulin. Any patient, even pregnant, that is treated with insulin, this is already considered the very high risk and must not fast. And from pregnancy point of view, this patient is high risk not to fast because of two things. Number one, because she's pregnant, and number two, because she is diabetic. So she has a license from a religious point of view not to fast because she's pregnant, and she has another license not to fast because she's diabetic. So we, we need always to remind uh, our caregivers about to be respectful of individual beliefs and autonomy of the patient because uh, this, we're, uh, we're uh, going live with this presentation into different countries, including Egypt, UAE, and other countries. So I would refer you to your local religious authorities for confirmation of those uh, things, but we're giving you the, the majority consensus of the uh, Islamic scholars. So now we'll shift gears to the high risk, which is should not fast. We're decreasing the tone here from must not to should not. So here, type two diabetes, that is not controlled. This patient must should not fast. Even the patient with type 2 diabetes, even if this patient is controlled, but he's taking insulin that has multi-dose injections, which has bolus insulin, which is fast-acting ultra-short insulins, this patient, because of his insulin regimen, he uh, or she should not fast. Any patient, again, that is pregnant, that is type 2, even this patient is pregnant and uh, controlled by diet only with no insulin, but still because she's pregnant, she should not fast and she's considered high risk. Performing intense labor physical activity, uh, this should not fast and well controlled the type one, even type one that is controlled 
because they are already on insulin and na insulin uh, bolus, which is the meal uh, insulin fast acting, this patient should not fast. So pregnant type one should not fast from those two slides. Now we'll shift gears to the moderate to low risk uh, category. Uh, well controlled type two diabetes is low to moderate risk if this patient is not taking any secretagogues and or treated by lifestyle alone, uh, taking metformin, acarbose, those they do not cause hypoglycemia in creatine therapies and the newer sulfonylureas and the newer SGLT2 inhibitors, which is dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, uh, and canagliflozin. Uh, TZDs, which is the pioglitazone, uh, the actus, or basal insulin, not the, uh, the bolus insulin. So the basal insulin is Lantus, Levimir, um, Teresiba. Those are the peakless insulins. They do not cause hypoglycemia on their own. So from those two slides, we agreed that all type 1 patients, whether controlled or not, are considered high or very high. Any pregnant, regardless her, uh, her medication regimen, is considered high or very high. The third, so any patient, male, female, pregnant, non-pregnant, that is taking prandial insulin, which is fast-acting insulin, those patients should uh, are at, at high or very high risk. Um, there is another way of risk stratification. You have 12 domains with those little questions. You ask that question, and then you give that question a score, as you can see. Then you calculate the total score. If the score is from zero to three, this patient is low risk. If it is from 3.5 to six, then moderate. If the patient is above six and he falls in the bucket of the high risk, and this actually assesses your decision on how to manage this patient or to advise him not to fast. So we discussed the risk stratification. Now we're gonna to move to the medication adjustment to, to have our comprehensive plan. So type two, we'll start with type two diabetes management in Ramadan. We'll start also with the non-insulin pharmacotherapy for type two, which are the tablets and the non-insulin injections like the, the Victoza, which is the liraglutide and Trolicity and so on and so forth. So those medications in this table in front of you, they are, yeah, those medications uh, are considered safe to start them in the Ramadan and safe to continue them in Ramadan. And there is no dose change or dose adjustment required because of fasting. Number one is the biguanides, which is the metformin, no change. DPP-4 uh, class, uh, the inhibitors, cetagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin. This is on Gliza, Genovia, and uh, Tragenta. So those, if you remember, they just, they don't cause hypoglycemia, so they're safe in Ramadan. And when you take the tablet, they wait for the sugar load to come when you eat or you have uh, some glucose in your blood, then it works uh, not through the pancreas, but actually works through the gut to release some hormones, which is called the incretin uh, effect and it brings the blood sugar level down, so it does not cause hypoglycemia. It only waits for the sugar load to come in. The acarbose, which is the glucobay, the TZDs, which is the pioglitazone, all of those four categories or domains are safe to start and continue in Ramadan with no dose adjustment because they bear no or no risk of uh, hypoglycemia. So this is the second uh, slide. So medications that are safe to continue in Ramadan, but not to start on Ramadan for uh, different reasons. The SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, the, those, this class of medications, they're oral tablets and they excrete about 200 to 300 calories of glucose in the urine. So they do not cause hypoglycemia, but uh, they mainly uh, come at a risk of dehydration, they bring, they, they are kind of diuretic. So we do not initiate them within four weeks of Ramadan. And we need to reduce the dose or hold it temporarily for high risk patients who have high risk of dehydration. So any patient above 75 years old that is frail 
anyone that has estimated glomerular filtration less than 60, so his kidney function is lower than 60, or on loop diuretic. So he's taking loop diuretic and taking this diabetes medication, SGLT2s, that might increase the risk of dehydration. So we do not start them uh, in Ramadan, this class, because of the risk of dehydration, not because the risk of hypoglycemia. And we hold this class and stop it if the patient has vomiting, diarrhea, or orthostasis. And we can discuss that also because there is a list of sick day management called SADMANS. This is an acronym, uh, acronym that covers the medication that you need to stop for a patient if he is diabetic and sick. Sick with diarrhea, vomiting, or he's not eating any calories because of uh, he is sick. And we'll, we can discuss that in a whole course uh, through Pharmavigate, inshallah, in the near future. So the, another medication, another group class that is also safe to continue in Ramadan, but not to start within four weeks of Ramadan, is uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is the liraglutide, which is Victoza. This is once a day injection. Uh, Dulaglutide, which is a weekly injection, trulicity. Semaglutide, uh, this is a newer, uh, a newer Victoza, but it is weekly injection. And now in the US, it is available as daily oral tablets. The GLP-1 receptors, they work as the DPP-4s. They wait for the sugar load to come, and then they work through the incretin uh, system, as I told you, and they bring the blood sugar down through some gut hormones. They do not cause hypoglycemia, so they are not safe here to start because of the side effect of nausea and vomiting. Imagine a diabetic patient that is planning to fast Ramadan started fasting today, and you started this uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist today and he's nauseated and he might vomit because of the side effect of the medication. So it is not Ramadan friendly for this reason, not because of hypo. There is no risk of hypo with GLP-1s. It is just because of the nausea and vomiting. Medications that may need to be adjusted or changed to you due to the risk of hypoglycemia when you are treating type two diabetes. The secretagogues, those are the medications that squeeze the pancreas to get insulin out, we call them the, the secretagogues. There are the, from the tablet point of view, we have two things: the sulfonylureas, which are the three medications that you can see, glimipride, which is taken once a day, daily, and uh, gliburide, and it's called also um, glibenclamide, uh, and glicolazide, which is the dimicron MR30 and 60. The other uh, secretagogue class, the meglitinides. And uh, the, glass the class representative is the repaglinide, which is gluconorm. And, you, and I consider the meglitinides or the gluconorm or the repaglinide as if it is oral insulin. It, is, uh, it peaks very fast and it kicks and hits and runs and goes out of the system really quick. So um, I consider it as if it's oral insulin. I treat it as if it's oral insulin. So what are the recommendations for oral secretagogues? If, so the first recommendation is to consider if the patient is on sulfonylurea of those three or meglitinide, repaglinide, consider switching to a different uh, drug class with lower risk of hypo hypoglycemia. So maybe you can change the glycolazide or the uh, gluconor to a DPP-4 from the ones that we discussed, uh, cetagliptin, saxagliptin, or linagliptin and uh, you start them uh, with your counseling and advice because they do not uh, require hypo, they don't uh, bear hypoglycemia and they do not increase the risk of dehydration and you can start them uh, safely. If uh, continuing, the, if the patient decided to continue on the sulfonylurea for whatever the reason is, and most of the time it is because of the cost, they are very economic and cheap, the sulfonylureas, then consider to switching to a safer agent within the sulfonylurea class. And one of the safest is the glycolazide because it is closer relatively to the normal physiologic response of insulin secretion in a normal uh, person. So if you're gonna give a sulfonylurea, I would rather recommend uh, glycolazide. 
or Glimmy Pride, but I prefer Glick Lazite personally, and that's my personal opinion. Uh, so if you're gonna go with sulfonylurea, you can also reduce the dose by 25 to 50 uh, percent. And we will have another slide to explain that better. Uh, if the patient on uh, ripaglinide, ripaglinide also it is the safest secretagogue out of the oral uh, tablets. So if the patient is on sulfonylurea, you can change him to ripaglinide also because ripaglinide is re relatively safer than sulfonylurea. Um, for this uh, class. This is another depiction. If the patient is on sulfonylurea once a day, take the dose at iftar with no adjustment. If the patient is on twice daily dosing like glyburide, so give the same iftar dose, but in suhoor reduce the dose uh, by 25 to 50%. Uh, if the patient is on a high risk sulfonylurea, give him a lower risk sulfonylurea like Glyclazide or glimepride. So now we're going to shift gears to Ramadan insulin adjustment or, uh, or change recommendations for type 2. We discussed the tablets and the injectables, non-insulin. Now we're going to discuss the insulin. And before we dive into... Um, sorry, give me one second. I think my uh, slides are not moving. Dr. Sarah, can someone give me a thumbs up if you can see me if, and hear me? Because uh, my slides have froze. Oh, Dr. Ziad, we can see you. We, can, we are following. That's fine. Okay, the slides are... You can just stop sharing and please re share again. Yeah, I'm trying even to find my cursor. Uh, Dr. Sarah, can you stop sharing uh, here? Yeah, because... Yeah, that's fine. It's uh, going. Sharing. Let me share once again. Uh, I cannot find my cursor. I might have uh, some technical difficulties. Dr. Sara, should I leave and uh, join again? Uh, yeah, we can do this if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I'll do this because I cannot even find my cursor. Okay, yeah, please, we'll be waiting for you. If this is recorded, you can maybe stop or... or uh... No, no, that's, we continue, just I'm following okay. up with the attendees, so we can have like more details till you come back. Okay. So uh, till now, uh, Dr. Ziad went through a big journey about how to manage diabetic patients in Ramadan, which is very interesting for us. And uh, this is kind of a nice collaboration, starting collaboration between ourselves, Pharmavigate Academy, and the Alex Syndicate of Pharmacists. And all the entities will have like certification of attendance about this uh, event. And we'd like this to be like a step in your uh, career journey. After Dr. Ziad will finish, we will have like a Q&A session. So please go ahead, ask whatever you want to have regarding this. He's an expert in this. And also before we finish, we will have some kind of uh, survey about this event. And based on this, we need to make sure that you entitle your uh, full email and full uh, uh, name so we can send you all the certification about this. Welcome back, Dr. Ziad. Is it fine now? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmah. Let me see. Yeah, I'm having the same issue. I cannot uh, run the slideshow like uh, the cursor. I'm losing my cursor on my uh, slides. I cannot uh, point at anything. Doctora, can you uh, can you share the slides yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. I will do this from my side. No worries on this. Just please, one minute. So, okay. So make stop sharing from my end and then take over, please. 
I guess now it's shared from my side, right? Uh, I'm not sure if you're sharing my. Yeah, go, go ahead if you can. Can you uh, slide uh, slide share? Can you start uh, slide share? Uh, I'm already sharing, Doctor. Now. Okay. So, can you slide show? Yeah. So we are we finished this one, right? Um, I need someone to confirm that they can see the slides. All it, all okay. Abdullah, you can you can find the slides, right? Yes, doctor. I see the slides. Please okay. share the slideshow and maybe move five to six or ten slides and tell us what. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So Ahmed is not able to have it. Just I will reshare it again. Uh, yes. Okay. I would reshare it. But, uh, huh? Now it's shared, right? Yes, shared, but not in the full screen. Yes, we can have it in full screen. No worries on this. That will be, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we can make it okay. in full screen. Okay, so Next. Dr. Ziad, let me know when you need me to stop. Next. Yeah, insulin refresher. Yeah, this is okay. where we go. So before we dive into insulin dose adjustment or change or management for type two diabetes, I'll just give you an insulin refresher to give you an understanding exactly the art and science of the dose adjustment and the medication adjustment. Okay, next please. Next. So we have the bolus, basal and pre-mixed uh, categories. So the bolus, as you can see in red, we have the rapid acting insulin, which is the insulin analogs, Novorapid, Apidra, Humalog, so insulin Lispro, Glulysine, Aspart, and in yellow, the short acting insulin, which is the historical insulin uh, R, so Humulin R, and so on and so forth. Next. Then basal insulins, as you can see, the green window which is the intermediate acting, which we all know, the humulin N, which is MPH. And the next red window is the insulin long acting Detemir, Glargine, or Deglodec. And the pre-mixed uh, pre insulin at the bottom, which is the most popular in Egypt and some uh, countries, which is the mixed start 3070. Now there are the analogs with uh, 25, 75, 50, 50, and so on whether it's uh, analog or human insulin. Uh, so for the bolus insulin, as you see on top with the yellow arrows, we are always concerned with the onset of the insulin and the peak when it reaches the peak, because we need something to be as close as possible to the normal physiologic response of the insulin secretion in a normal person. So the onset of those fast acting insulins between nine and 20 minutes, that's, we, that's why we say, give them with the first bite of the meal or very, very shortly before the meal. Uh, the short acting insulins, which is the yellow window, uh, you might have to take it half hour before a meal, 20 minutes to half hour before a meal because the onset starts after 20 minutes to 30 minutes. So we don't want to have hypoglycemia. And that's why it is a bit risky if the patient injects the insulin, and then he forgets to eat. That's why the evidence supports using the analogs, which are the aspart, glutalysine, and lispro, because evidence, especially with type 1 patients, they cause low hypoglycemia and low nocturnal hypoglycemia. And they are more physiologic. Uh, they, they mimic the physiologic response of a normal insulin secretion, as we will see in the next few slides. Next. So we can see uh, uh, the previous one, please. Yeah, so this uh, window, the red window, were uh, directed to the intermediate acting NPH and uh, the humulin N, for example. And this has a peak. It peaks at five to eight hours, but we are more concerned with the intermediate to long acting, not about the peak, but rather about the duration. So the NPH lasts about 18 hours, but we hope it, uh, it lasts about 24 hours. So we can give it once a day, but it's not. That's why the longer acting insulins 
are uh, in play now because the, we call them peakless insulin. They do not have a peak, as you can see. So insulin glargine, lantus, detimir, levimir, and insulin deglodec, which is Treceba, they are peakless insulins. Next. So now there are, this is the normal natural physiologic insulin response. In a normal person, non-diabetic, this gray line, as you can see, the, the gray line at the bottom, the gray line at the bottom, this is the basal insulin going in the background in, uh, from a normal pancreas. This makes your heart uh, work. This brings the blood sugar level from glycogen and puts it into your heart and lungs, even uh, if you're not eating, even when you're sleeping. So it gives you the energy you want. And it also regulates your blood sugar level between the meals. But those three mountains or the, those three peaks that you can see are those three peaks when you have three meals, insulin is secreted to bring this blood sugar level down and so on and so forth. And this is the natural physiologic insulin response in a non-diabetic person. In a diabetic person for type one, for type two, those peaks are not high enough because of low insulin secretion. They don't have 100% function in pancreas. So we'll press next and now we will see how uh, the insulins available in the market would mimic or not mimic the natural physiologic response. Next. So now the human basal insulin, which is the MPH, the intermediate acting that now we can see it has a peak. We hope it is superimposing to the low gray line that we can see down there, but it is not. It has a peak, it should be peakless. That's why it has a higher risk of hypoglycemia and we do not recommend it. Next. And this is the insulin analog basal, which is Lantus, uh, Levimir, Trulicity. It's almost superimposing on the gray line, basal line. So it is normally uh, close to the natural physiologic response in, uh, in human beings. So that's why the basal insulin analog is better than the MPH human basal analog. Uh, basal uh, human uh, insulin MPH. Next. So this is the human bolus. The human bolus, which is the humulin R or act rapid. This is the human insulin, the, the historical human insulin fast acting. And as you can see, we have three peaks to mimic the insulin response, but actually there are gaps. Number one, the, the, the peak does not superimpose on the natural peak, and there is a gap. This gap, this means that the insulin is skewed to the right, as you can see, so it is not superimposing on the uh, natural physiologic response, and it is not superimposing on the glucose. So it, it is available in the blood when the insulin, when the sugar is not there. This means it has higher risk of hypoglycemia. This gap that you can see that it is skewed to the right and it is not skewed to the left. This gap causes hypoglycemia. So human bolus insulin, human and R, or hum act rapid or whatever, they have higher risk of hypoglycemia compared to analogs. Next, this is the other analogs, but they are the bolus ones, lisproglycine, epidra, um, humalog, as you can see, they are the most close to the human, human physiologic insulin response. They are almost superimposing on the natural physiologic response with no gaps to the best of their ability. That's why the analogs are recommended by evidence because they cause the they pose lower risk of hypoglycemia compared to human uh, bolus insulins. Next. So in conclusion, analogs, whether basal analogs or bolus analogs, they are more or mimic the natural physiologic insulin response. That's why they are more recommended compared to the non-analogs. Next. So now we're going to dive deeper, deeper into the Ramadan insulin dose adjustment or change for type 2 after we did the insulin refresher. Next. 
So type 2 diabetes, if the patient is taking insulin, so insulin dose adjustment recommendation according to Diabetes Canada, the first recommendation is to give a less intensive glycemic targets during Ramadan. If the glycemic target before Ramadan was 80 to 130 milligram per deciliter, we make it less, uh, yeah, more lenient, less aggressive. Instead of 80 to 130, we would tell them uh, increase the 80 to 100. So 100 to 135 milligrams per deciliter. Why to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia? We're so afraid because of fasting. We're so afraid from hypoglycemia. So don't get the patient to be in the level of the 80 because 80 can be 70 and 70 is hypoglycemia. So give him a more lenient uh, target of 100 up to 135 compared to the pre-Ramadan target. Next. So the recommendations for insulin ad adjustment to be continued here, we'll discuss the basal insulin uh, if the patient is on basal insulin, then continue because this is the preferred uh, option, basal analog, sorry. If it's basal analog, as we mentioned, Detemir, Levimir, uh, Lantus, Solostar, and so on. Those are the preferred options. Uh, but consider reducing the dose by 15 to 30% because the patient is not eating as much. He's not eating three or five meals with snacks during the day. Although it is basal, maybe the energy level is less uh, and so on and so forth. So we reduce the dose by 15 to 30. And then because we're monitoring the blood sugar level this many times, then we can see if our decision to decrease 15 to 30 was enough or it was too strong. And then we adjust the dose by one to two units as we will see. The other basal, which is the MPH, if the patient is on pH, we, we recommend to consider switching to a longer acting basal insulin analog from the top class because the MPH we, we learned together that it does not match the natural physiologic response and it has a higher risk of hypoglycemia compared to basal analogs. But if the patient will continue on MPH, if he was on once a daily dose, then reduce the once daily dose by 15 to 30% and take it at iftar. If the patient was taking MPH twice a day, then give the regular dose at iftar and the suhoor dose give only, uh, the, the, reduce the dose by 25 to 50%. And I hope that from this set of slides and from this presentation that you can capture the art more than the science. So if you did not review those guidelines, I think what I'm saying makes all sense. It is intuitive. It is reducing the dose that the, the, the dose with the meal that has lower uh, uh, food. Next. Uh, moving to the short-acting uh, insulin analogs and the human uh, regular insulin. So if the patient is on analogs, it is the preferred insulin option. So continue it and uh, give the regular dose at iftar, but at suhoor, the bolus dose, you need to decrease it by 25 to 50% and cancel the lunch dose because there is no lunch, there is iftar and suhoor. Compared to the human regular insulin, if the patient is taking act rapid or, or humulin uh, R, consider to switching to analog because it bears a lower risk of, of uh, hypoglycemia and nocturnal hypoglycemia. If continuing on human regular insulin, then follow the same dose recommendations by giving the regular dose at uh, iftar and decreasing the dose of tussuhur by 25 to 50%. Next. And this, uh, we already covered that. Next. Uh, if the patient was pre on pre-mixed insulin, like the 30-70 mixed start, which is very, very common in Egypt, it is not a preferred option uh, for type 2 diabetes, but for cost and many, many recommendations, then sometimes we have to give the analogs. Why it is not preferred? Because it it is not flexible. It gives the basal and bolus fixed ratio dose that patient might not have enough uh, food to, uh, to have uh, to cover the bolus insulin 30 into the injection. And he might not have, might not need the 30 uh, ratio because this inflexibility bears a risk of hypoglycemia. So it is not preferred. 
So what to do? We might be able to consider switching to an alternative regimen that has lower hypoglycemia. So if the patient still has a functioning pancreas, we can go back from basal, uh, so from uh, pre-mixed insulin and step it back to basal insulin plus oral agent. So give him basal lentis and oral, or, or basal MPH and oral uh, agent like a DPP-4, for example, or uh, SGLT2, but before Ramadan by four weeks and you adjust. Or basal insulin and GLP-1, which is the uh, Victoza and the basal insulin. Uh, Lantus or NPH or whatever. Or another regimen which bears a lower risk of hypoglycemia, which is basal insulin plus one time uh, mealtime bolus insulin. And, uh, or we can give basal bolus with each meal, which is compared better, comparatively better, relatively better than the pre mixed uh, regimen. If continuing the end, the mixed start or the pre-mixed fixed ratio insulin, then reduce the suhoor meal dose by 25 to 50% and take the usual iftar dose uh, because it is the biggest meal, you don't do adjustment for that. And then because you're monitoring, 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 then you know if your decisions were correct or not. Next. Next. So type 1 diabetes management in Ramadan, as we agreed, type 1 is always high risk or very high risk. Next. Type 1 diabetes, if the patient is already on basal bolus, which is the normal regimen, the basal analog insulin is preferred to use analog and reduce the dose by 20%. Even if the patient is on a pump, the basal dose, which comes in the background, which is actually actually a fast acting insulin, but the basal regimen, they use it by 20%. The bolus rapid acting insulin, use the analog is preferred than the regular human. We already covered that. And pre-mixed insulin is not appropriate for type one altogether. It is uh, not recommended for type one altogether. You cannot treat a type one patient with mixed start, but you might be able in type two, but it's not recommended. Next. So now we're shifting gears to fluid and dietary advice and nutrition in Ramadan. Next. So the 10 principles uh, according to the IDF guidelines and the GAR, DAR guidelines for the Ramadan nutrition plan, the 10 principles is to divide an adequate amount of calories between suhoor, iftar, and if necessary, one to two snacks. So don't just eat iftar and don't have suhoor or eat a huge suhoor, uh, iftar and very little uh, suhoor and so on. Meals should be balanced with 45 to 50% calories from carb source. 20 to 30% from a protein source, and uh, less than 35% from healthy fat source. Uh, principle three is design meals using the Ramadan plate. The Ramadan plate is available on a website that uh, Dar Alliance, and I will show you that in the next few slides. Avoid sugar heavy, heavy desserts, which is very, very tough in Ramadan, but this is very important. Uh, use more gl low glycemic index foods, high fiber carbs uh, are preferable like complex carbs and high, far, high, bar, high fiber uh, uh, oatmeal and so on carbs. Uh, hydration should be maintained between meals by drinking water and don't only wait to drink water in suhoor, but drink lots of water during the non-fasting times. Because if you drink a huge amount of water in one uh, time, the diuresis increases and then adds to the risk of hydration. So, in the, so hydrate yourself throughout the time of non-fasting and avoid hydration by non uh, avoid hydration by sweetened beverages coca-cola pepsi and those things uh, amaruddin kharoub uh, karkade and those things that are sweetened just if you're uh, thirsty drink water those are empty calories that we do not recommend uh, take suhoor as late as possible and this is uh, uh, a recommendation uh, by sunnah by prophet muhammad peace be upon him to uh, Eat suhoor late and eat suhoor. Don't skip suhoor. Adequate protein and fat should be consumed at suhoor to induce satiety or satiety. Uh, if you only eat carbs in suhoor, then the carbs will last you two to three to four hours. 
but then you will be very hungry and you might have hypoglycemia. Uh, so recommended to mix your carbs with fat, healthy fat and healthy protein, so it can last you longer, uh, six, 10 hours and so on. Iftar should begin with water to rehydrate and one to two dates. The IDF guideline says one to three dates because of the sunnah of the single uh, digit, the odd numbers. Uh, the dates here in UAE, there, are the, the, there is the majdul uh, dates, those are huge. So I will not consider uh, one date is one majdul. The majdul maybe is equivalent to two dates. Low calorie snacks such as fruits, nuts, or veggies may be consumed between meals and it should have some healthy fat and protein like in nuts and so on. Next. So this is what I told you about. There is the Ramadan nutrition plan map. It's on uh, the Dar Alliance. Uh, back, back. Yes, this one. So the daralliance.org, the slide, the link that you can see, they have pre-made plan suggestions for different countries. Egypt is one of them, Pakistan, United Arab Emirates, and so on. So those, uh, next. The example, as you can see, for Egypt, for example, for uh, 1,200 calories per day, and they have recommendation for 15 calories per day, 1,500 calories, 1,800 calories, and 2,000 calories. And uh, the calories uh, in Suhoor, they, uh, they are telling you uh, 450, so maybe 540 to 720 calories uh, Suhoor uh, recommendation in Egypt, and iftar snack in Egypt, and iftar meal in Egypt and healthy snack in Egypt. And in any country from those countries in the map in the previous slide, you can pick the country, pick the calorie recommendation that you want according to your height, weight, and BMI. And then it can give you some recommendations that are, that are culturally adaptive to this uh, country. Next. The fluid intake, we already discussed that in the principles, but I want to cover the coffee and tea because they are natural diuretics. So if you drink lots of coffee and tea in the non-fasting time, then during the fasting, you might lose a lot of water and might add the risk of uh, dehydration. Next. So exercise advice, next. So avoid exercising during the fasting hours. Why? Because two things, the risk of uh, hypoglycemia and the risk of dehydration. And the last three hours before iftar, they bear the highest risk of hypo glycemia and dehydration. I know many people, they say, oh, the best hours to play fo football or soccer is just one hour before Ramadan. But I have uh, I've witnessed patients who did that, diabetic patients, and they had the acute kidney injury because of severe dehydration. They did not have enough water in their system to perfuse their kidneys, and they had acute kidney injury, and they had to be hospitalized as emergency. Next. So when to break the fast, next. So one of three things, if this one of three things happened, we have to break the fast and advise the patient. You teach the patient those three things, so he takes the, or she takes the decision of breaking the fast. One, if his blood sugar level is documented to be less than 70 milligrams per de deciliter, then he breaks the fast, whether it has symptoms or no symptoms. If he has, uh, severe hyperglycemia, so um, above uh, 300 milligrams per deciliter on the reader. The third the thing is if the patient has symptoms of hypoglycemia or symptoms of hyperglycemia or symptoms of severe dehydration, or he has acute illness like uh, uh, diarrhea or whatever, regardless of the reading on the meter. But if you have any of these symptoms, then take a reading also to confirm it. But without even testing, you have the license to break the fast. And what are the symptoms of how hypoglycemia are trembling, sweating, chills, palpitation, hunger, confusion, and headache. And the hyperglycemia, uh, extreme thirst, hunger, frequent urination, fatigue, confusion, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Next. So now the last thing will be the blood glucose monitoring recommendation. Next. So when to uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose, which is called SMBG, uh, there is a myth. Uh, some people ask a regular question, does breaking the skin invalidate the fast? 
and the response, the religious authorities agree that glucose monitoring does not invalidate fast. Next. So the frequency recommended for type one is five times a day, but some patients, they don't. Uh, for type two, if the patient is on insulin, we recommend the two to five times a day, which might have a little bit of cost in Egypt, for example. But if the patient is on type two and not requiring insulin, then we might individualize it to less than two times and we choose those. But at any point of, of time in the day, if the patient has symptoms of hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, then he has to test. Next, the IDF guidelines and DAR Alliance, they agreed on seven points in the day that are recommended. If you need to test two times or five times, or one time, choose one of those seven points. The first point is the before suhoor. Second is the morning after you wake up. Third is the midday. Fourth is the mid afternoon. Fifth is the pre sunset meal, which is before iftar. Six is two hours after iftar. Seven is at any point if you're symptomatic of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia or feeling unwell. Next. So we, we, I'm done with my slides and we covered in summary the risk stratification, glucose monitoring, fluid and dietary advice, the exercise, the medication adjustment, and when to break the fast. Those six domains are the six things that are evidence-based that you need to discuss with your patients in planning Ramadan, before Ramadan fasting. So for, I would say, at least a good two months in case you need to change a dose or start a medication, a new medication for your patients. I hope these slides were informative. And uh, next, uh, please, uh, next. Those are my references. Next. So I hope that you can take any of these informations and implement it if immediately with a family member, the your security guard in, uh, in your house or al Bawab or whoever, the doorman. Uh, so I hope that you can take any of these informations and implement it. And I hope that you can take it and start changing lives. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Dr. Ziad, for that, such an informative session. Uh, I never experienced to be in such like an educator for diabetes or dealing with diabetes. And uh, it was very, very good for me even to learn from your experience. And it was excellent for everyone. I guess coming years, we will be in a very high demand for more pharmacists to be in such a domain, to be educator, to be aware of how to deal with diabetes and how to guide patients in a very constructive and informative way because this kind of relation between patient and pharmacist that was we looking for improving the healthcare like we can say experience can start from the pharmacist who is the hero behind the scene so thanks again for this and please i guess we have a few questions uh if you don't mind i will have it okay uh, let me check the question here and i will just try to figure out Okay, so if anyone wants to open a speaker and raise a hand to ask a question, so I'll, I'll be with you for the next, I would say 20 minutes, if you, has any Q, if you have any Q&As. So you can feel free to write your question in the chat window. You can feel free to raise your hand and we'll give you the mic access. You can ask the question in Arabic, English, or in any language that I'm not aware of, and I'll try to do the translation for our non-Arabic speakers. Uh, so please uh, write any question. I saw a question about why to change the pre-mixed insulin uh, before Ramadan. So the pre-mixed insulin in type two, in type one, of course, it is not a recommended. Uh, uh, it is not a safe option for diabetics, whether Ramadan or not Ramadan. So we don't treat type one with pre-mixed insulin. That's number one. But now, but the slide was mentioning the type two patients. Type two patients on mixed TARD, uh, I'm talking about those patients that are in severe catabolism, because by the way, in type two, some patients are managed by basal insulin alone. So their diabetes or, or just metformin alone. I'm not talking about those patients. I'm talking about the patients that have severe insulin deficiency. 
that if you don't give them enough insulin and you don't give them enough insulin with their meals, they will get hyperglycemia. Don't give them enough insulin at bedtime, they will have catabolism and they will break their fat, they will break their muscle and uh, they will go into DKA. So with those patients, the, the, the mixed or the pre-mixed fixed ratio insulin, it is not safe because it is a fixed ratio. What if the patient does not eat as much or eats less and the background insulin, the NPH is gone in the background, it is not, you increased it, the pre-mixed insulin, you increase the dose because you're gonna eat more, but unknowingly you're giving a higher dose of the NPH in the background. So you're adding to the risk of the hypoglycemia. So we're saying relatively, we need to change it because it is relatively more risky than the analogs. So if you give basal bolus or basal oral or basal uh, uh, DPP-4 or basal saxenda or basal uh, insulin with Victoza, those are the regimens that we, that are preferred and uh, recommended. I hope I answered your question, doctor. You had, let me uh, uh, mention the name. Dr. Marwa Rabia. Did I answer your question, Dr. Marwa? Please write in the comment. So uh, please, any other questions, can you type in the chat? So uh, Dr. Zaid, if you don't mind, just I need to uh, share now, like we have a survey about this event. So I'd like everyone to like participating in this and give us their comments about it. So if there's any more like question or something we can do to improve the sessions in the coming future, it will be highly recommended from your side. And yes, Dr. Marwa said it's more than enough. Thanks for that question. And if anyone also looking for any more questions, we will send for you uh, the certification of this event based on the survey that we have. So please make sure that you have your full name as it's supposed to be. And also, yes, I will share with you this. We had one request before about sharing the slides with the audience, is this possible, Dr. Ziad? Yeah, definitely it's possible. So number one, the slides, you can share it. Number two, I'm available on social media. Someone is asking, I'm available on uh, uh, Facebook. This is uh, how my name is uh, pronounced, uh, written on social media on Facebook, Ziad Ahmed El Gamal. And um, on, on LinkedIn, it's uh, Ziad, Z-E-Y-A-D, El Gamal also. Um, I'm available on Facebook um, and on LinkedIn. That's that's all. You can also reach me through Pharmavigate at any point of time with Dr. Uh, Sara Ramadan, uh, the owner of Pharmavigate and the founder of Pharmavigate. And uh, at, also I'm available on WhatsApp. I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Sara, you can share my contact with anyone. Uh, you can, um, I'll, I'll type it here, 0097154266. Yes, one more thing, doctor, we can add it to the slides and then we can share it with everyone if they like to reach you. And I guess coming days we will like, I guess after Ramadan we'll have something amazing regarding the training about diabetes from your side. It will be such an honor to have it with you. So also we keep informing uh, everyone about those courses and what will come in the coming future. Sure, so I added my WhatsApp and we'll add them to the first slide of the presentation and then Dr. Asara will share with you all the slides, inshallah. And, uh, oh, okay, the glitazones, how about using glitazones during Ramadan? Glitazones are known, like it was in the first slide, the glitazones, that they do not require any adjustment. The pioglitazone, which is actus. And rosiglitazone. Rosiglitazone is not available in most countries now because of the risk of heart failure. But the American Diabetes Association guidelines, uh, the newer guidelines away from Ramadan, like just the regular uh, pharmacotherapy management guidelines in the American Diabetes Association, they are putting the sulfonylureas with the pioglitazones, the thiazolidine diones, the TZDs. They put them in one category. If you cannot give the other high cost medication, just use those because they are, um, they are available as generic now and they work. So the pioglitazone, it is an insulin sensitizer. So it increases insulin uh, sensitization. So uh, it, is, uh, it works and the sulfonylureas, they're very economic. So here in Ramadan, 
to your question, pioglitazones, you give them the way it is, that you can start them in the Ramadan, you can continue with them in Ramadan, uh, but the risk uh, of hypoglycemia, uh, so, but there is no risk of hypoglycemia and there is no risk of dehydration. So they are safe medications to use in Ramadan. Are they that effective? It depends on the patient. They can be on add-on to metformin and others, but they cannot be immunotherapy depending on the uh, pancreatic function and the amount of insulin the patient is secreting on his uh, own. They are safe in Ramadan, yes. Any other questions? Uh, the questions also, by the way, can include any career advice. So uh, anything about uh, the practice, the things that I did in uh, community pharmacy that pe people consider it non-clinical, although, although in Canada, so I'm a prescribing pharmacist, so I prescribe, like I write prescriptions from scratch and I'm at retail pharmacy. Uh, those diabetes clinics that I did, they were all in, in retail pharmacy. So you can make the change wherever you are. Um, I got my PharmD when I was in retail and I used it in anticoagulation clinics. We used them in the influenza vaccination clinics, in the smoking cessation clinics, weight loss management, uh, Many, many things that you can do, whether in retail and all of that is considered clinical. From what I said today, if you are working in retail pharmacy, also you can implement all those recommendations. You don't have to be in hospital settings to make the change. So yeah, I'm trying to brainstorm with you for ideas uh, for more engagement. Uh, so Dr. Zian, if you don't mind, I, I have more, one more question because I felt that uh, we have uh, challenges all the time with the behavioral part from the patient side. Yeah. So can you please like uh, elaborate how you found this kind of the challenges with the patient here in UAE and how you felt this kind of the medication compliance? Do you think that for diabetic, we have an issue with this? Do we need to address something? Do we need help? And also I need to remind that we only reached uh, nine responses from the survey. I need to make sure that everyone can gain their certification. So please, follow the survey link. Excellent, so thank you, Dr. Asara, amazing question. So regarding the survey, your your uh, your certificate will be shipped to you like via email or something once you're done with the survey. There is a certificate, I think, from Pharmavigate and another certificate from Alexandria University. If you are, is that correct, Dr. Asara? Uh, it's from Pharmavigate and uh, Alex Syndicate of Pharmacists. Yes, Naqabit uh, Sadlit Iskandari. So this is amazing opportunity. So please fill the survey. So this helps us improve and uh, to be uh, to, to cater for you what exactly you need. And and we hope that you will fill that survey. You don't have to, like, we want you to, to do it as soon as we're done with the slides, with the presentation, or while we are, I'm speaking. I, I don't think it will take more than one minute. It's a 30 second survey. That's number one. Number two, to the behavioral point, the, an amazing question that Dr. Sara mentioned. The knowledge is one thing and how to transfer the knowledge to your patient is another thing. And this is actually, it has a pivotal um, focus now in all guidelines is the diabetes self-management education. How to educate your patient to take decisions and you, you educate him about knowledge, skills and behavior. So you tell him, when you think this way, you do that way. And the way the educators, so a part of my certified diabetes educator uh, 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 didactics that I had to study to pass my exam is the behavioral education part. So I have to know as an educator how I have to learn how to educate patients. And by the way, this will be part, inshallah, of our PharmaVigate diabetes self-management education, the art and science course. This will happen in the near future, inshallah, stay tuned. I highly recommend that you log on PharmaVigate uh, website and pages so you can stay tuned and uh, subscribe there. I'm not sure there are many, many ways to do it. Please register your name so you can receive all the notifications from PharmaVigate because we're working on a a huge course that all what you need to know about diabetes in one comprehensive course, it might be between uh, around five days on the weekends. 
we just need to know more information from you, what you exactly expect. So yeah, we'll cover that in the course, how to educate a patient and uh, the adult learning theories uh, from the patients. So what a patient expects from you, then how you can tailor any educational material. And actually I implemented those theories today. And if you learned something from me today, maybe because I implemented those theories in preparation of my slides and the way I spoke to you. So if you saw this valuable, I hope inshallah, you'll stay tuned with Pharmavigate so we can have all uh, the updates and uh, what is happening in the pipeline shared with you, with your voice to help us uh, bring our course uh, forward. Any other questions for, regarding the slides, regarding the future, regarding the course, regarding career advice? So yes, we have no more questions here, Dr. Ziad, and it was very honoring for us to have you and like to host you with us as a big speaker. And I know Cliven Abu Dhabi is doing such a great job in that such domain as well. And you are the leader there. So please uh, keep us informed about any updates, any guidelines, whenever anything needed for every pharmacist to learn about diabetes, we'll be happy to learn from your side. So thanks again for today, and we will keep in touch for sure. If anyone requesting for anything, you have the contacts of Dr. Ziad. Also, we are on the social media from Navigate, and we will contact with you with the slides and certification based on the surveys. And have a very lovely evening and happy Ramadan for everyone. Inshallah, Dr. Uh, uh, Sara, we, uh, uh, the recording for the session will be available for everyone. Uh, actually, we are on the uh, YouTube right now, so it's available on the Pharmavigate uh, channel on YouTube. We have it also on Facebook, and we can add it to uh, anyone who is looking for it. So just name it for us, and we will send it to you the recording. So yes, no worries. So please, for everyone, if you enjoyed the, the session today, please uh, refer your colleagues if you think they will benefit from this uh, slides or presentation. Please refer them to Pharmavigate pages so they can follow the link for the uh, slide so they can listen to this session again. And uh, it, you can share it uh, free for everyone. We'll have it available on the Pharmavigate social media and uh, website. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Dr. Zia. Thank you uh, everyone for sparing this time to be with us. And thank you Dr. Asara for the sponsor and uh, for being with us and advancing pharmacy all over the world, in uh, especially in the Middle East and Egypt. Thank you so much. We'll keep in touch, inshallah. Thanks for the contribution for today. Have a lovely evening, Dr. Zia. See you, everyone, and happy Ramadan.